So we are in session 22 today and uh, in this session we will continue with 3.0 features which includes uh, lambda expressions uh, with the generic delegates uh, called func and we'll continue with lambda expressions which is gen generic delegates uh, called action. We'll see what are they and how can we use them and also lambda expressions which is specialized delegates. There are a couple of uh, predefined specialized delegates available and how can we use them and how the language uses them implicitly also. And object initializers, we'll see what are they. And collection initializers, we'll see what are they. Uh, and also anonymous types, implicitly typed arrays, and uh, query expression, which is uh, re relating to the link, which is language integrated queries. We'll, this is a startup for the link. And finally, the expression trees. So expression trees is just an overview, not into a deep dive. Um, and uh, we'll see with this, we'll cover almost all the 3.0 features. Okay, let's kick off session 22. So we'll see uh, more of the lambda expressions today and then continue with the remaining uh, 3.0 and also some of the 3.5 features. Um, some of them, okay. So, um, uh, as you know, uh, it's not possible for me to cover everything uh, available. So, these are some of the very, very key things um, uh, with respect to the language editions uh, introduced in C Sharp 3.0. Uh, we are covering them. And this is one of the examples that we have demonstrated um, in the last. And uh, Yes, uh, so if you see the bottom most statement, uh, the, um, the recommendation that I'm passing to you is to look at the, uh, there is more uh, to the lambda expressions, the way the conversions happen. Um, there are certain constraints on the conversion and one of the con basic constraint is that the data type mismatch kind of thing. So for example, on the left hand side, you specify the parameter type as int and on the right hand side you are actually not handling that as a, you are treating that as a different data type and that conversion is going to fail and also uh, most importantly uh, the the delegate see uh, for example in, in this case we don't see any delegate right so we'll see today uh, where the delegate is gone right so because as we know the lambda expressions or anonymous methods are um, associated to a delegate that's the fundamental thing um, as you know, the method cannot exist on its own, right, because there is no name here. Um, in other words, if the named method can exist in a source code, and that can be invoked by anyone. In case of a, uh, anonymous methods or lambda expressions, they don't have a name. So they, without a name, they cannot exist on their own. So they have to be associated to a delegate. So that's a, a fundamental root of uh, the anonymous or lambda expressions. Okay, so if you just say just only n um, lambda operator uh, n modulus 2 is, is equal is equal to 0, that statement doesn't really make any value unless until that statement is associated to a delegate. Okay, that's a fundamental thing. And more going forward, as I've been saying that you will not see the delegates uh, as a delegate keyword. Um, in this case, if you see the numbers, numbers is a list of uh, int, uh, int, uh, int uh, generics. is again a generic list of int data types. In this case, uh, uh, the the list has a method called find all, which takes a delegate, which which accepts a expression. Uh, it, we'll see uh, what it is today. We're going to see more of that. Okay. Um, so don't worry about that for now. So uh, we will see more of that in detail in various examples uh, and we'll move on. Okay, so that's to start with. So this is again um, um, in 3.5, we're actually jumping a little ahead. Uh, if you see the previous one, it is on 3.0. If you see on the left hand side on the top, uh, it's a 3.0 feature. So 3.0, we have the lambda expressions and the way uh, that's where 3.0 ends and after that comes in 3.5 um, C sharp lang uh, language got a predefined delegates. So in, in so far we have been actually defining the delegates and then making use of it. So uh, to make our life more easy the language actually came with a predefined delegates which you don't have to declare and uh, every time. So that's how 
we don't see a delegate uh, going forward. Uh, so what, what you're going to see uh, is the two types of delegates, or predefined delegates, or uh, in other words, these are generic delegates. Again, so what is generics? We did talk about generics in detail. So generics are the uh, types that can um, uh, uh, that can be used for parametric polymorphism, and we did discuss that when you based on the instance that you create um, uh, for the generic classes, uh, based on the data type that you associate, the generic is going to be playing with that specific data type and it is dynamic in nature. So you can have constraints on top of the generic classes which we have seen. I don't want to go deep into that again. So we'll see generics again. So we will be seeing generics. In the previous slide we did see a generic called a list of int and the list of t, in other words the definition itself, in this case uh, the func f-u-n-c of t1. So t1 is a type parameter. And also t result is a type parameter. So when we did talk about the generics, we did talk about uh, what is this t and how it is written as. So in, uh, the fundamental aspect of a generic is that the the, the logic that uh, you handle on a collections or uh, specifically for collections, um, uh, that can be same. We did uh, this. Uh, we did talk about these stacks as a good example. So stack. Uh, taking as a T as a type parameter and the body of the uh, generic stack can be so generic that it can handle any data type. So when you actually, so when you make your body specific to a given data type, then you need to associate a constraints on top of it so that whoever uh, make create instance of your uh, generic class, they can pass only the data type that you are expecting. Uh, we have three different constraints and we did talk about that like the uh, the constructor constraint we have and also the or derived constraint we have and also the, the reference type and value type constraints we have. Um, so the, the three constraints that you can add on top of the generics and uh, we did talk in detail and if you really want to refresh them that's fine. You can refresh as many times as, as possible but that's very important topic that you need to memorize because going forward uh, we need to visualize things behind the scenes uh, otherwise uh, we will not understand the code um, because it's becoming more and more concise going forward. So that's very important to um, understand what's happening in the behind the scenes. So that's the reason I'm trying to get you into the predefined uh, genetic delegates that we have right now. So these are the five flavors of uh, the function. This is FUNC itself, you can read that as a function. Uh, it stands as a function because it takes a parameter and also returns a parameter. Uh, returns a value, sorry. Um, so again, the, again, going back to the little bit, bit of basis between the method and a function, so method, the difference between a method and function is that a function can return a value, value whereas a method cannot. Otherwise, both accepts parameters, both can have a set of statements, they're good. So only difference is that uh, a function can return a value and a function can be called directly just like an instance uh, method and um, uh, and the, the return value can be uh, assigned to a local variable okay so now so the generic delegates uh, uh, just to satisfy most of the common requirements of uh, a delegate uh, since you don't want to create a delegate for a simple things like a, for a function which takes a, a parameter and returns a, a value so for for to handle most of those generic usage uh, wise, um, 3.5 came with uh, five standard uh, functions which are generic functions, uh, sorry, uh, function delegates in other words. So these are the delegates which are standard signature which can, in the first case if you see um, the t result, t, t result itself it says that it is not an in parameter, it's an actually out parameter, okay. So these functions, uh, a little different the way we have seen the delegates. The only difference is that since it is a function, and it uh, since it is a function, the para list of parameters on the rightmost side uh, will have the written type. In this case, uh, in the first case, if we see, when it says uh, function, t result, it's just a result. So the keyword itself is uh, self-explanatory. So it, it doesn't have an in parameter, but it has a 
written parameter, uh, uh, written type in other words, let's read it as a written type because T stands for type parameter. So this function, uh, this delegate function can return a sum value but it doesn't take any input parameters and if you say a second one it takes a one parameter and returns a return some data so of course the function by definition itself they return something so from the right hand side if you see they return something all t1 t2 t3 are the ones that are input parameters okay and t result is the output parameter so you can visualize this is something like you know um, the method overloading we have seen so it has it, it overloads based on the uh, various parameters that is coming but not based on the written type so the t result again since uh, t is a type parameter the the data type that you pass in when you create an uh, instance of this particular delegate uh, will define its type rather than um, is a, a specific type and there is no uh, restriction on T1 it, you can actually put any structure or a or a reference type or a value type doesn't matter so it's open so based on this um, you will need not create a delegate of your own as long as um, you just straight away use this okay there is one more um, um, uh, generic delegate introduced in uh, 3.5 uh, that's called action we'll see in the next uh, step <clears throat> okay so how do we uh, make use of this in this code example so this is a, a way so now I'm not uh, going to declare a delegate explicitly and um, make use of it so instead of that my func func is a generic delegate in which I created uh, created an instance of it f12 okay and he, in this case I'm specifying it's going to take one input parameter which is of type int because it's t1 is generic right it's so a type parameter in this case I am specifying that to be an integer and it's going to return a string okay so it's taking one input parameter and returns a string and this is my lambda expression and now I have my delegate I'm trying to just highlight this okay this is my delegate definition right so this delegate definition says that okay it takes one int and it returns a string so that's uh, that's what we have been doing so far right so delegate whenever you declare a delegate we specify the signature of the method that you want to associate to it so that signature will have basically two things well, one is the what is the type of parameter that's going to take and what is the written type so in a general if it is a method then its written type is always going to be void right and if it is a function then the written type is going to be non void you have a sum written data type so in this case a little more concise right now we don't see a delegate keyword so we don't see a delegate keyword because the func is a generic delegate okay and uh, by definition of the generic delegate it takes one in parameter and this is the written type so since it is a function it will always have a written type so if you have only one param uh, one data type defined here that means that's the written type so it, it must have some written type and if you leave it only one value uh, one data type here that means that's that is going to be its written type and that means it doesn't have any input Time. so that's the understanding you need to uh, set up to your uh, learning curve now and uh, as I mean uh, as the definition itself uh, showed up here is that uh, the T result is the written type and the remaining all going to be input parameters hope that's clear no confusions uh, you need to memorize that at this stage okay going forward we will see more of that because going forward I won't say that FUNC uh, is a delegate uh, and we have been using that delegate instance um, by specifying the respective data type whenever we do okay so you need to memorize that at this point and now the right hand part the right hand part is your uh, lambda expression as we have seen right so okay sorry so this is the lambda expression and we all know how to divide this we divide based on the operator right so if you take a 
if we divide this statement into uh, into three blocks, the center part is your lambda operator, right? On the left hand side is your parameter, on the right hand side is your body, right? So on the left hand side it's just simply i and it's a single parameter, uh, that's why we don't have a open and close brackets, right? And it is i, just i, no data type specified, that means it is implicitly uh, inferred based on the return type that you're going to provide. Okay, and on the right hand side, this is the body wherein uh, we are using the conditional operator. If uh, we have introduced this conditional operator and also going forward we'll see uh, the null coalizing operator also. So this is more and more concise now. So it is, it, this statement says that the condition operator is going to check for the value. It's a, uh, the condition operator has a question mark and colon. So that's where the difference is, okay? The question mark uh, on the left hand part of the question mark checks the condition and on the right hand side it has two parts. One is the true part, another one is a false part, right? So in this uh, conditional operator usage, the body is again, it's going to check if uh, i uh, modulus 2 that means uh, your integer, i is going to be your integer, that's your input. It's going to take one input and the return type is string. Okay, so the return is if i modulus 2 is 0, that means it is an even number. So we're going to say even. This is a string. So that means we are returning even if i is uh, i modulus of 2 is 0. And if it is not, then we are returning odd. So this function, uh, one line statement, when we invoke by passing an even number, it's going to return out saying even. And if it is an uh, odd number, it's going to say odd. So that's going to be uh, the, uh, the core explanation of this single statement. So I hope you're clear with this. If you have a doubt, um, uh, if you want a more concise explanation of this statement, uh, then let me know. We can do that again. Okay, so we'll, I'll move on to the next uh, example. So the second example. Okay. The second example again, FUNC. This is a delegate. It's taken two in parameters. Okay, and the third one is the out. That means the written type. In this case, uh, I chose to have all ints. It's going to take two integers and uh, one integer out. In other words, if you write this normal, uh, this function uh, in normal uh, way, it's going to be looking like this. Um, if we'll say, okay, I will not put the modifier, consider that it's a private, so it starts with int. I'll say, what's say add, for example, because this is a named function, so that's why I have a name called add. Oops, and it's going to take int i and int j, right? And oops, it's going to do what? It's going to return, in this case, this method is actually adding those i and j, right? Written i plus j, right? So this is what the named version of this uh, block if you read and uh, this whole thing is uh, very concerned. Now this is, a, um, we have a delegate because we ha on the right hand side we have a lambda expression and the lambda expression we'll uh, see. Okay, so in this case these are the two input parameters, right? Like i and j and the return type is integer. This method is integer. And since this is using a lambda expression, this doesn't have a name. So again, a lambda expression or anonymous methods are nameless methods, okay? That's clear again. And we have created an instance of the delegate f, f30, uh, just some name, okay? You can, it can be a, a very meaningful name. Since I have so many uh, examples, so instead of giving a long name, I just thought of giving some number, number to it. And uh, f30 is actually the instance of the delegate and we are associating a method which is a, uh, represented as a lambda expression here. 
So this lambda expression, if you take a close look, again break it with the lambda operator. Okay, it could be a, as simple as a very simple question. Um, uh, it could be like they will give you an um, usually in exams normally uh, if you go for any um, uh, provit dot com or even with the MSD in exams, um, people uh, a simple question could be like this. Uh, they can give you an expression like this, and they'll say, um, "Can you evaluate if this is a valid statement?" And yes, you, you should uh, able to evaluate it based on the. Uh, okay, this is a we know F U N C is a built-in generic delegate, and it is taken to uh, in this case in the signature we see three. Uh, param uh, three parameters out of which first two are the in parameters and the last one is the written type and of course this is the instance name uh, that is uh, of this type okay and now this is type safe now because we have specified the uh, data type it, uh, when we create the instance of it and this f30 is associated to a lambda expression which is of course need to match the delegate signature right because the delegate signature is taken two ints uh, okay this i and j they need to be integers uh, in this case we did not specify that uh, they are going to be integers but based on the return type if, uh, it's based on the how you're going to use on the right hand side it's going to determine its uh, data type and uh, in this case i plus j indicates that you're doing addition on the, um, the both the uh, data types uh, that's the addition is what this is a return out and the return type is integer so it matches with the return type and the statement satisfies and of course again the lambda operator is where you need to break it to uh, analyze it okay hope that's clear it's pretty clear and uh, uh, straightforward okay so, and in this case uh, I'm passing uh, if I invoke it uh, passing 10 and 20 then I should be getting 30 because I'm the operation here is then addition okay so that explains the third one and the okay the third one again it uh, it's taking oh, it's the same repetition here so my my bad okay we'll see a code example so no problem so it's pretty much same thing. You hope you understand. I'm, what I'm trying to do here is to explain uh, the whole uh, uh, usage of the built-in uh, generic function versus the real-time use. Okay, so, the, uh, so I just want to make that clear. In this case, I just missed the right um, screenshot, um, so that's why it's just repeated. Otherwise, it has a three input parameters uh, and uh, one output parameter in this case. Uh, in the latest one, this is the max one that is supported in uh, 3.0, and of course there are more added in 3.5. Uh, um, that's an added note there. I will show you uh, what are the new additions in again 3.5 also, and uh, yes, oh, I'm sorry, 4.0. So this is actually 3.5. Okay, uh, sorry, my bad. And uh, funk here is taking the four input. Uh, uh, data types, input parameters, and this last one is the written type. Okay, if you have a doubt, okay, how can I add more? Yes, you can add more, but that's again available only in um, 4.0. Uh, with respect to 3.0, the max is 4 plus 1. That means the written type. So max parameters you can take is only 4 uh, in 3.0. And Funk has more additions up to 16 parameters. Uh, if you see the 0 to 16 in 4.0. Um, so in 4.0 you can add more actually. And if, uh, and if none of these uh, satisfy uh, your need, definitely I don't think uh, you will definitely have a function which takes more than 16 input parameters. Um, if at all you really have such function, then you need to really think about it. And 16 is too high number. Uh, no matter what, you should never write a function uh, that takes so many input parameters and uh, manipulate it. Okay, so if at all you're getting into such situation, always uh, reconsider other options. You will definitely have uh, other options to make it simple. Uh, again, if you going back, refer back to the basic principles behind coding. Uh, I, I will give you a little overview. Um, there, are, there are a couple of, of course, uh, uh, principles like uh, keep it simple. Uh, in other words, it's called as a, a KISS principle. K-I-S-S, -S, don't mislead it, uh, don't mistaken the keyword. K 
KISS, -S, uh, many times it's happened that people do mistake that uh, um, uh, acronym. Uh, KISS stands for Keep It Simple Stupid. So that's uh, one of the you know um, principle that will uh, tell you that uh, if your function, if you write any function in a real time, um, and if the function uh, goes, uh, we'll see. Just trying to deviate a little bit, uh, but we'll come back, no problem. So I just wanted to just recap on that. If, for example, if you have a function like this uh, written, and if you can't see that whole function in one uh, screenshot, if you have to scroll like this to see the entire function, that means you actually complicated that function. You need to uh, reconsider simplifying it, uh, simplifying it such that uh, you don't have to scroll to look at the whole function. So that's one of the uh, basic uh, uh, KISS principle talks about. And it's a really interesting principle. And if you really uh, consider in that principle, uh, 16 input parameters is too high, actually. You should never be using that. OK, so the last one, um, in this case, uh, it's, ta it's taking a four parameter. It's simply actually returning the addition of all these uh, four. Just to, to keep it simple, okay? You can do actually do a, a, any any kind of algorithm here, and uh, we'll see a demo of this. Um, and the output here um, is pretty simple. Uh, we see the even and out, and uh, because since uh, this slide doesn't give you the whole uh, piece of source code, to keep it simple, so. We have the whole source score here, which we're going to run now, and uh, look into other options also. Okay, so that, this is the one I wanted to do. Okay, if, the, if you once you get this uh, source score out, you, uh, please follow the name of the uh, file within which I just put the lambda expression, and in, uh, I just named this as with generic delegate. Um, generic delegate func and also action. So next step is the action we're going to see. Okay, so in this case, what do we have? We have a uh, quite a number of uh, flavors uh, used in the first case here. Um, we have just a written type, okay? Just the written type, it doesn't take any parameter. And the, the body, no parameters in, and it just returns a string. So you, uh, when you when you do an expression, a lambda expression, uh, you don't use a written keyword, right? So you just have to specify what is going to be out. And that's treated as a written type. And of course, we have seen if you write a, a anonymous or, or a statement within the brackets, uh, within the curly brackets, then you need to use a written statement. And then you, you should say written hello world. Otherwise, it won't be working. So this is a simple. Uh, whenever you say if it is a, a lambda expression or an anonymous anonymous method, the first thing is you will determine based on the operator, the lambda operator. Okay, this itself will tell you that it's a lambda expression. Okay, so and yes. So in this example, it's pretty much straightforward. It is uh, once you invoke it, it's going to return what you have written here. Just hello world, simple. And the second one, it's the, uh, this uh, instance is going to take one integer and return say boolean, and it's going to just uh, the body is actually checking for if i is less than five. So in this case, if I pass uh, four, it's going to say true, and if it is um, eight, then it's going to say false. As simple as that, right? Okay. And the third one uh, here, this is interesting. So we have uh, going to we are going to refresh our nullable int. The nullable int, I hope you remember, the question mark followed by int. Uh, this is a nullable int. That means uh, you can assign a null to this value type. This is a value type, but you can assign a null to it. And uh, of course, since uh, func is a generic delegate, you can actually pass anything. Uh, it, you can actually pass even your custom class instance also. I have an example for that as well. <clears throat> so it can take a value type or a reference type, and the value type, type can be a structure, or it can be a class, or it can be a nullable type, or anything. There are no restrictions, because it's generic. And yes, and the body, again, is actually using our last uh, session's topic, which is the null coalescing operator. So what this means is, it's going to return, of course, this, this operator is going to work only with the null nullable types. It could be value type or reference type. Okay, And uh, what this statement means, hope you can recollect, 
if i is not null then written i else written 5 okay if i is null then written 5 so what is going to ensure that uh, you always get a default value 5 uh, if i is null so that's what this statement means so this function it always ensures that you will get a positive number and you never you will never get a negative or a null number not a negative but uh, you will never get a null value there uh, you'll get a positive value based if your if you uh, have a positive value otherwise you get the default value and this is very very useful when you do with uh, when you when you play with the database operations when you get a null value from the database and you want to uh, wrap with the default value if the database returns a null and uh, keep in mind nullable types are very very useful when you really play with the databases and in this case we used uh, nullable types in the first example when we pass null as an in parameter we'll get 5 because the default is 5 okay and if we get some positive number we'll get that out or even if whatever the data type takes in this case integer can pass one and negative numbers also that doesn't matter okay so that's about that and the third one we have uh, seen in the uh, slide uh, with the conditional operator uh, wherein we saw the even and odd numbers right okay and anything else interesting here and this is a plain addition and this is a plain division and addition addition so all are again simple so we're going to run this out and if you see the output and compare uh, to our definitions so if you see carefully again going back to the little little bit of basics here um, so f1 is actually the delegate instance and we have associated the lambda expression as a method to it and the method signature should match the delegate and this is the delegate and we are not seeing a delegate keyword now okay so we just see the func now because the func is a uh, generic delegate so which is available in the uh, framework and it's available in the system namespace that's again an important thing so again so where is it available it av it's available in system namespace and in this case I have only system namespace included and the generic namespace included uh, I included generic because uh, again func is generic right um, yes and again yeah I wanted to show you again different flavors of uh, uh, the func right so how can you do that how can you ensure which one is introduced in which version so if you go to Visual Studio 2010 and uh, view the object browser okay um, here if you say because since it is in um, okay I will switch my uh, filter to 2.0 okay and hit search so there are no results okay and again I'll pick 3.0 and hit search no results that means func this uh, just uh, generic uh, delegate is not introduced in 3.0 also and if I hit 3.5 so there I see these five delegates so that, that's when uh, that's how we can ensure that okay these are introduced in this 3.5 for sure and if you really want to uh, check a specific thing in a given framework then this is the best way to check instead of you know referring to several articles or referring to MSD and using the object browser you can actually do it and we just since it is a we just 2010 uh, we have the latest framework 4.0 also in 4.0 we have up to 16 as I said so 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 many versions we have uh, we can make use of it if it's a t16 up to t16 middle uh, you can have uh, uh, 16 in parameters and finally one parameter out and um, pretty sure no one will need such a long one um, yeah again I repeat uh, we should really reconsider using such a methods okay so that's all about the func hope you're clear with that now the actions action is just similar to func no big complication there only difference is that the action is a method it doesn't written anything okay and this one interestingly um, uh, the zero parameters version is actually available in 2.0 okay so it's available in 2.0 which is called a thunk. A thunk is again a, a technical word uh, we refer to its uh, 
um, more like a conditional uh, um, it's used in a delayed operations uh, as part of the functional programming um, so in in general the implementation of the tongue is possible using a generic method without a, a parameter less a generic method where you can define a method uh, and uh, mask the invocation of the uh, the delegate implementation uh, based on the need so you can invoke based on by name or based on the need so we don't want to get into more details of that uh, for now but uh, just FYI if you're if you're interested in exploring more on this keyword THUNK thunk then you're more than welcome and uh, that's a, a generic uh, programming uh, concept it's not specific to C sharp anyway uh, and uh, in C sharp we can implement the thunk using the uh, parameter less delegates and the actions uh, of the parameter less one that means where n is zero that indicates that uh, it doesn't take any parameters okay so this uh, is available in c sharp 2.0 whereas the remaining things were actually introduced uh, from zero to five as usual it's there in 3.5 and of course zero to 16 is available in um, 4.0 and it's pretty similar to what the function is only difference is that the return type is void okay other than that it takes the same set of uh, one uh, in parameters you don't see t result here all are t1s and t2s so that means it doesn't return anything it takes only in parameters and of course the methods they just do something some operation without returning anything and a simple example here uh, is hello world okay as simple as that and uh, this um, action it doesn't have uh, any parameters okay if you see uh, and it's a0 that means no parameters in this case and it just written a statement say console out right line hello world it's a static uh, or a hard coded value returning out and once you invoke this it just writes this so what, what where are we going uh, with all these predefined uh, generic delegates so what this indicates is that uh, you do you don't have to create a delegate of your own anymore so if you look at any scenario um, imaginably any scenario all those scenarios can be handled by using the uh, the predefined built-in generic delegate FUNC for functions and for methods action so whenever you really have you are really thinking about creating a a delegate by using the signature that we initially discussed like declare a delegate declare a delegate is gone so you don't have to declare a delegate delegate is already there uh, you just have to make use of it the way we have we are showing here okay so going forward in your programming life especially if you are using the C sharp uh, at least 3.5 onwards 3.5 onwards if it is 3.0 then of course you have to declare your own delegates and make use of your uh, lambda expressions or anonymous methods. If it is framework 3.5 onwards, the generic delegates are available. You don't have to create any more of your own. Okay, that reduces the programmer's uh, life, uh, eases uh, development cycle again. So in this case, the function, uh, um, oh, sorry, the action with single parameter in. So it, since it doesn't have a written type, so there is no uh, second parameter here. It just take one parameter in whenever it's action. And A1, it's actually taking MSG. In this case, uh, this is the parameter. Again, if you slice it based on your lambda operator, left hand side is the parameter and the right hand side is a body. And the body is actually saying hello and you have a placeholder which is filled with the MSG. That means uh, when I invoke it with some text here, that's going to be emitting a hello um, with the name that is received. Okay, so this is a different way to um, having a, 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 a static or a hard coded value versus making it a little dynamic. Okay, these are just examples. You can actually ha explore it uh, based on the need. You can actually make use of it. Uh, uh, the body wise, implementation wise, you can actually make use of, use of it in several ways. The third one, it takes a uh, two in parameters so one is string another one is int and again this need not be a string it can be anything any value type or reference type you can put your own class uh, in going forward we'll see using a custom class called person we have been using it uh, most uh, commonly throughout our 
examples. And in this case, uh, this is a little interesting. Uh, what this function is going to do is uh, it's taking a string in and passing a placeholder or a position in the string from where I want to truncate it. So in this case, uh, we're actually using a string dot substring of R. R is the uh, uh, number, which is an integer, right? So what we're going to do is when it's a substring of R, then we're actually uh, 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 retrieving the, uh, the string starting from the R from the str. In this case, if you say hello world is passed as a main string and we give a 6 as a placeholder, the substring is actually going to truncate uh, the first 6 characters and the remaining is going to be retrieved. So it's, that means starting from 6th index, we return the remaining. That's what it means. So if you say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 is gone. So starting from uh, the 7th, if you say world, so world is written back. So this is going to be very useful when you're playing with strings and uh, yeah, I think I did, we did have one assignment uh, related to this uh, and uh, I think string.contains also you can use to search for a given keyword and in this case it's actually uh, breaking the string or triggering the respective one. This is going to be very, very useful one of string when you're playing with strings, um, it's going to be very useful. And the third one here, again we have all nullable types, three nullable types, that means it's taken three nullable uh, ints and uh, what it is doing, it is actually doing the associative uh, 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 principle on the uh, null coalescing operator. We did this exercise uh, uh, wherein we checked uh, the associative principle applicable on the null coalescing operator and in this case when you pass the null null 5, um, you get 5 because it's go this operation is going to ensure that you get uh, a, a valid number out. Of course, if you pass all nulls, then you will get null out. And the second case, uh, null 1520, so it's actually written 15 because the first operation itself is succeeded not to return a null, so the J value is written out. If you put 20 and 15, then you will really should be getting 20. You will see uh, that when we do the demo. And the third one is a little more lengthy, if you see. More number of parameters I'm adding and more, num more the code is going to be more junky, right? Uh, I really hate this kind of code wherein you have ton of uh, input parameters and uh, you're doing, a, and especially when you're talking about the uh, the lambda expressions, uh, I've been recommending making, keeping it very, very simple. So if you play with the lambda expressions with a ton of uh, operations then you'll be definitely get lost because the the conciseness of the the nature of the conciseness of the lambda expressions are going to make you confused and the readability of the code will be gone for a toss uh, and uh, that's why uh, although you have uh, uh, action takes 16 in parameters um, try to avoid using uh, uh, those many number of parameters because if you see at the four now four parameters itself it is so clumsy right and in this case, okay, uh, forget about that. And uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, seen this part. I believe uh, um, in this case, what we're trying to do is concatenate all the four strings and the written out. Uh, how we are doing that? We are using string dot concat. And uh, we, if you see, if you, I think we did have an example with this uh, statement like this: an array of objects, right? We are passing an array of objects and initializing that. Uh, with the parameter that is coming in. So this is another way is called uh, uh, array initializers, uh, implicit initialization of the array and uh, if in concat context this is uh, called as a parameter. So parameter of array and there you can actually pass any number of parameters to it as an array and all those will be concatenated. Um, so just um, to cover some of the string uh, functionalities, I just added that here and in this case when you pass uh, just do it uh, with explanation then all that will be concatenated to a statement uh, and a sentence, a sentence, a sentence is written out using the concat, okay, that's an interesting one. And last one is the my custom class, whereas it's taking uh, five parameters in and of course it's just printing them out, so how it's go doing, it's uh, uh, taking person. Now in this case action is taking my custom class. There's a P1, P2, P3, P4, P5 
And what it is doing in the body, if you see the, uh, an, another example of a multi-line statement, right here, this is one statement separated by a semicolon, okay, and another statement here separated by a semicolon and so on. So actually we are invoking p1 print. So uh, the person has a print method and we're just invoking that. And uh, this is how we can call this uh, method by passing the new person of the parameters. And if you remember, this has a parameterized constructor. That's how it's taking these two input parameters directly and creating instance of it. And once you uh, invoke this, the output uh, should look like this. Okay, so this is the hello world, hello um, name and the world for the third one and five for this output uh, um, and so on. So we can actually visualize this and just do it and the, this is the output for the last one. We'll see in quick demo. So it's more easy to uh, walk through the code um, when uh, we are in a slide than in the code. And I want to show you the actions as well. So we'll see there are again T16 uh, action in framework 4. And if we filter with uh, 3.5 then we have these list of uh, only 4 are available. And if you go to 3.0, there is only one. As I said, this default one without any parameter, input parameter is uh, available in uh, 3.0. Uh, in fact, it's there from 2.0. Okay, so other unlike uh, function, action is available from 2.0 onwards. Okay, good. Now, we can take the action stuff. So these are plain methods um, that you can make use and similarly we just we walk through this example in the slide hello world which takes a zero parameters in and just uh, write some, do some action and in this case it takes the one parameter in and uh, it's con uh, and making use of that parameter and of, of course you understand this statement now I don't have to break it and explain again uh, on the left hand side is parameter, on the right hand side is the body. And anything that I did not cover, yes this one, again in this case uh, we have three in parameters. <coughs> uh, one is int and two are double and uh, we are actually writing down the some um, mathematic equation on top of the uh, input parameters that we had received and the resulting uh, Pretty much you can imagine that as a calculating an interest on a given amount, uh, just an example. It couldn't be a, a, a correct formula, but just some expression, okay? And the third one, we did, we did discuss about this and also the fourth one is the person, right? So I hope you are clear with this. We can actually, so this covers all the possible data types that uh, I, w I wanted to show you. Since action takes a T as a type parameter, so type parameter can be anything and based on you create, uh, you create the instance passing the respective types, it's going to be mapping to that given type. So F50 uh, is a mapping to a delegate that takes person as a parameters in this case. That's how I'm going to read it. And once you run this out, so it's um, going to give you this output, so which is again, what we did cover. Once you get the code out, if you walk through the code, then uh, probably you can take it for more. So this is how you can make use of the generic delegates and we will move on. And last one, uh, with respect to lambda expressions, um, again, these are specialized declarations. So these are, um, again, um, available in .NET 2.0 but uh, the addition in uh, 3.5 uh, is that the these methods can take uh, the uh, replaced uh, with respect to uh, to the additions called functions and the actions which are uh, generic functions and generic actions the first one is the comparison so this is again this is a very 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 useful uh, for uh, different uh, specialized declarations with respect to the generic delegates and these are available in 2.0 onwards. So um, we are going to see them today and um, this will help us to simplify again the way we 
make use of them. We'll see with, with examples. Uh, hope you understand them clearly, especially with the collections. Okay, so generics are again associated to collections, and uh, in this case, the comparison delegate, which is built in a delegate, which takes t as a type parameter, and of course, it takes two um, parameters in, and this comparison is actually returns an int. If you recollect, we did uh, add, uh, we did use the i comparable interface and implement the compare uh, method to implement or comparison uh, in one of our collections example. I think I have that open just to re recap and uh, that will definitely help us in understanding how best we can actually make use of this comparison. Let me, okay, so this is not the one. Yep, in uh, collections we did made use of that actually. If you see this, yes, this is the one I was looking for. In this case, uh, we have uh, defined a class person comparer uh, which implements an I comparer imp uh, interface and the compare implementation was actually trying to compare these two objects because it takes an object as an uh, input and in this case we have written this specific comparer with us for the person. Right, if you remember it clearly, um, we did have a person class. We wanted to add a collection of persons to our sorted list. And since the sorted list um, comes with um, a default comparison algorithm for the predefined data types, which are integers or value types and other things. But since this, this is my person, um, my customized uh, user defined data type, I need to specify a comparer which can compare to sort the elements inside the sorted list. So for that, we actually have to, to implement the uh, person comparer which has the definition of comparing these two persons. In this case, IDs we have compared and uh, written a positive number. In this case, this statement is as good as doing this way. Uh, returning a positive number or a negative number or zero. Based on this, it determines which one will come on top and which one will come on down. So this is how we did uh, pass in the comparison algorithm uh, specifying how you're going to um, determine which one comes first and which one comes later. Okay, And we did pass uh, uh, the values as a 200, 500, 300, 100 and when we run this code, it sorts them and um, puts them out in a sorted order, which is 100, 200, 300, 500. Okay, so we did see this. And now, how our uh, delegates and the generic delegates help in simplifying this code? We, as you see, we have written a lot of code here. We have written a separate class, which implements I comparer interface, and then implement the compare uh, method over over at the compare uh, method and then provided as implementation so on it's so, so lengthy right okay so how the how does uh, um, the generics help in this case the comparison is a predefined built-in delegate which you can actually pass into the sort in this case if you see the example here m comma n so in this sort if you see the uh, definition of tx and ty that means that t x is of type parameter t and again y can be type parameter t. In this case, uh, in the previous example, the uh, x and y can be person, right? And in this case, uh, lambda expression is used and taking two input parameters and we are returning an integer out. It's m minus n. If m minus 1 is exactly same as if you see the operation that we're doing here, which is id minus p1.id minus p2.id. Okay, so in in this case, we can actually make it as a person and just say, uh, if m is a person, then uh, p1, p1.person, uh, p1.id minus p2.id. So that's how we can actually write this expression as simple as a one single line statement. Okay, and yes, I have some examples uh, how we can make use of it and simplify sorting uh, using the comparison delegate We'll see um, that example. And the second one is a converter, uh, which can be used to convert a given uh, values within your collection to a different data type. 
uh, in this uh, good example I have a, a list of integers which I can convert into a list of strings we'll see that and also the third one is a predicate we did see this in the previous example but we didn't pay little attention to the uh, details uh, the predicate is again if you see the signature it takes uh, one type parameter and uh, returns a boolean and this is very very useful when we do the find all a searching algorithm uh, in this case the numbers dot find all method takes a delegate of type predicate so predicate you'll see everywhere in fact I would say uh, if you look into any of the collections you will see predicate everywhere um, just we need to pay little attention um, otherwise you will uh, m miss them only thing is uh, whenever you make use of them we just have to pay a little uh, attention to the so the point here is uh, to get and see the definition of this okay yeah this is what I wanted to get in and uh, check the parameters that each one of them are taking if you see the sort sort is uh, taking comparison this is a delegate and that's what we're going to use the comparison delegate and predicate if it is true for all this is a predicate delegate so we'll, this uh, is a generic one so this delegate uh, has a specific uh, method signature uh, for which you can actually associate directly with the uh, lambda expression so wherever uh, the versions are again remove all takes a predicate so you'll see predicate very often um, many places and in this case sort has a okay a sort has a two flavors again uh, overload members one is a comparison of t which is a generic uh, delegate and i comparer again it's a i comparer is an interface that's the difference between the com uh, comparison of t and i comparer of t so a comparison is a delegate whereas i comparer is an interface and we did uh, use the i comparer in the previous case uh, in comparison um, is a delegate whether we are looking at right now so if you take a close look at uh, what these each and every methods are taking then you will uh, come to see all of these uh, basic four specialized de uh, generic delegates and these are very very useful with respect to the lambda expressions okay so these are delegate which takes an expression as uh, for uh, basic operations like this sorting for sorting you can use a comparison delegate for conversion you can use a converter delegate for uh, filtering or search criteria you can use the predicate wherein you can pass the search criteria uh, to filter out so the expression that uh, you want to specify and need to evaluate to boolean okay so that's what it indicates and the last one is the event handler and event handler this you can you make use of it uh, whenever um, you handle any events again the basic standard uh, event uh, orgs uh, doesn't uh, uh, you want to handle other than the standard event orgs. Event orgs is the standard parameter that you see. In this case, it's a T event orgs. That means in the event arguments, uh, you can actually receive anything. Probably, if you are completely new to the event handling, we did cover the event handling also. But this is more uh, related to the Windows-based programming. Uh, we will see more of that from uh, from the next session. So we will be get from the next uh, after this session, we will be jumping into the real time code, uh, wherein we create a Windows based applications to start with, and followed by the uh, web based applications. So you will enjoy more probably uh, because so far we have been covering more of a theory. So uh, I know it may be a little boring, but it's very important. Okay, so we will see the specialized part of it and this one is gone okay so this is a specialized uh, code file wherein I have a couple of examples that demonstrate uh, these uh, specialized delegates to start with we have a data here which is a generic uh, int list of integers which are taking uh, some numbers from 0 to 9 in an unsorted order that's the key thing right so this is our raw in, uh, data so using uh, the various uh, expressions or delegates uh, we did see the find all which is taking a predicate right here if you take a look at the intelligence uh, 
oops okay no problem I hope you can see a uh, predicate so it's taking a predicate of int and that's when the int uh, is taking a number as a uh, int uh, parameter and the right hand side we are actually comparing it um, to make sure you return an expression true uh, for a given number so if this uh, n evaluates to uh, uh, modulus of 2 is 0 then this statement if it evaluates to 2 uh, true sorry uh, then the value is going to be added up to the uh, your output and similarly for R so we are using the predicate uh, uh, for uh, handling this lambda expression to specify that we filter out the numbers from this list the numbers is a list this is the raw data which is the numbers okay and we are making find all and filter out using the lambda expression and that's when we are making use of filtering out even numbers here and filtering out odd numbers here and we have we know what is var right so var is a uh, variable or a variant uh, data type which is uh, used for type inference so you, you don't have to specify the uh, actual data type at uh, design time um, but uh, based on the value that you assign to it it's going to evaluate to the respective data type and it's again type safe it's not it doesn't mean that uh, var is a variant uh, like in the legacy uh, 6.0 or a or var in uh, javascript so var in c sharp is again a, a type safe so even uh, events uh, once it is evaluated to a collection here list of uh, integers it's going to be type safe you cannot assign any other uh, data type to it okay so hope you're clear with that we did cover that in several uh, occasions so just want to recap on that and once uh, you get that uh, in we can use it for each to iterate to, uh, through the list and print them out and we know for each for you to use for each uh, the respective collection need to implement the I enumerable interface otherwise you cannot use for each on them okay so since the generic list uh, implements I enumerable right if you go to definition <coughs> yes it implements the I enumerable interface if you come across any collection that doesn't implement i enumerable then you cannot use a for each that's a fundamental thing and uh, yes in this case we listed all the even numbers out and odd numbers out and the yeah find all is done wherein we saw the predicate delegate uh, built in and the sort in this case sort is taking another expression here uh, this is a pretty simple expression right so we did use a I comparer uh, in the previous case and here we are taking the comparison here this is a sort is taking a comparison and this is a generic delegate okay so this is a generic delegate and we are actually associating the lambda expression here uh, what this expression is doing it's taking M and N as a two um, input pair uh, parameters and when we are comparing both because sort itself is by signature it takes two parameters in and it's going to uh, expect you to return an integer out so that's the delegate um, of the comparison um, which, which we have seen right so sort is using which one which is using the con comparison comparison takes two in and one written type is integer so that's where that's how we have m and n in and we are returning out a number out this evaluates to either a positive number or a negative number or a zero that will determine how the sorting is going to take care right and once the sorting is done we are reading the numbers out because we just sorted on the original numbers itself not we didn't use any new variable so the numbers now it is in sorted order originally they were not in sorted order if you see they are not in sorted order Oops, my bad okay that's about the sorting and next comes the conversion here in this case we are converting uh, the numbers into some words so this is a little interesting here so this here uh, the conversion actually I attempted to convert the numbers into words for example if you see one then it should written o n e one in English in other words, so, so on. If I say nine, then it should uh, written out as a n i n e nine. Uh, just a small uh, example here. How I did that is by creating an string array. Okay, this is a string array. 
definition and string array has um, the words in the respective indexers. If you see uh, the initialization, if you see again probably uh, this is again a new feature we did cover this part uh, uh, in arrays when we did discuss how we can do initialization this way directly um, by creating an array of strings and in, uh, initialize them directly or in other different ways we see more of that today again uh, as part of 3.0 feature this is actually a 3.0 feature uh, wherein we can actually assign the values directly in this case, the zeroth index has a word called zero. First index has one, two, three, four, and the tenth index has a T E N ten. So this is the value we have. And if I say, if I read uh, numbers passing the index zero, then I will get zero. Right? That's how it's pretty simple. And uh, in this case, I did exactly that. So what I did is I'm just passing the. I'm receiving con for conversion. I'm receiving the one uh, n as a parameter in and uh, I'm returning the respective indexer text out. Oops, again, I should be doing this dragging. Okay, so so when I when I get the number as 9, then this uh, string array will return me NINDA. So as simple as that. It's a pretty interesting uh, code there. And the last one. So once you did this one, convert all takes the, con that's the key thing here. It is taking the converter delegate. Okay, we're just taking uh, one uh, in uh, and string out, right? It is taking one string. Oh, it's taking as a C. Oops, let me recap again. So it is taking uh, the integer as an in parameter and returning a string out, which is similar to our function f u n c as a standard one. This is, this is a special type of uh, uh, delegate that we have. In this case, it's taking an integer in and it is returning a string out okay and is there anything else that's it so we are reading this out so we'll see in action okay so to explain this better how it is happening so this is the Okay, so this is the original list, <coughs> which is uh, 9 to 8, which is not in a sorted order. And the even numbers, we did able to get the, all the even numbers out into, okay, so this is what find all evens and the even numbers, uh, <coughs> sorry. Okay, so even numbers, so when you print it out, we got the even numbers out and also the odd numbers, so based on your lambda expression, we got all the odd numbers out here and uh, what else? Third one is uh, the sorting, right? Where is the sorting? The sorting is here. I can actually do this way actually. Yep, this is much better. Yeah, once I sorted it, I have this sorted order, 1, 2, 9. And uh, again, uh, the last one is uh, the words, right? So this is what um, this code was doing. Okay, so it's uh, returning the 0, 1, 2. This is a uh, uh, number equivalent to the number, uh, to the, uh, so word equivalent to the number, in other words. Okay, so that's all uh, <clears throat> with respect to the special uh, delegates. And these are very, very important to remember. And even handler, as I showed here, explore. So that's kind of a homework for you. You can explore more. A uh, couple of topics uh, I'm going to leave on your plate based on your interest. You can actually explore them. And, uh, and uh, we, with the end of that last slide, we actually passed the biggest hurdle with the lambda expressions. I hope you got, um, you understood what is a lambda expression and definitely, although you can't program it immediately after this, uh, at least by looking at the code, if you can determine that this is a lambda expression, then I can say that you understood what is a lambda expression. Okay, and I strongly recommend you to go download this code uh, from the SkyDrive and uh, start playing around. Uh, otherwise, uh, definitely, you know, um, you can never get it. 
you will forget it soon after the session again. So it, it sounds uh, soothing uh, music once you listen to the session, but once you go out of the session again, you'll forget everything. So to keep it into your memory, do some hands-on, it'll help you. Okay, this is the object initializers. Most of these we have already seen so far, but these are as part of the 3.0 features. Uh, I'm just going to cover them again. So if you see a very close look at this again, a very, a, again going towards writing a more concise code, uh, reducing lengthy code, right? So in this case, the first case, if you see, how do we used to create an object? Okay, so far, the traditional way. If you take a person class, I have a class person created. It has set of properties, okay? It has ID and name. All I intend to do is I want to capture the uh, person's ID and name, for which I have these uh, uh, implicit properties that I created. I don't have a local variable, so this is again a shortcut form of creating properties. And um, I have these two constructors. Standard value. Huh? One is the default constructor, other one is a parameterized constructor, and I have one um, instance method which can be invoked from the person instance, right? Which is going to pretty much print out the ID and name what it has. So this is how a typical uh, business object looks like. Okay, and once we have this class defined, we make use of it by creating instance of it. Um, if P is the instance of person and we actually invoke the default constructor which is not going to initialize your ID and name then in, hence we are actually as, uh, assigning the values for I, um, ID and name and then calling the print. What it's going to do? It's going to print ID and name. Right? It's pretty good. So this is what we have seen so far as a standard way of uh, defining um, and you making use of the class. So now object initializers overview. So how this can be simplified further? If you see the whole thing can be done in just one statement. How good is that? So it's very very good, right? So I uh, in this case um, how I'm going to create initialize uh, creating the initialization or initializing the object. So I have used uh, uh, three uh, statements here to initialize a person object. So in this case, I actually initialized that object directly in one segment by creating with a new operator. Okay, so I'm creating a new operator, creating instance of person, and I'm in this case initializing the respect to property. This is the property ID and with value uh, and name and value. Okay, you might say, okay, so this I can do because I already have a uh, parameterized constructor. I can even pass ID and name within uh, here directly instead of associating the uh, within the initializer statement with the, within the bracelets here. You can do that, of course, definitely. There's no harm in doing it. What if I don't have a parameterized constructor? That's when this is going to be more useful. So we'll see that part now. That's really interesting. Uh, for the sake of our demo, we will take away the uh, the parameterized constructor and then um, do this. Then it will make more meaningful um, in using the object initializers, right? Okay, so here, here in this example, so this is the person class, right? It has a parameterized constructor ID and name and the default constructor here, okay? And which you are well familiar with. Okay, so this is where our main method is. This is our traditional way of uh, initializing the um, class. And uh, once I invoke the print, it's going to print uh, the ID and name. And the second case is passing the uh, directly uh, initializing without accessing the, pro the respective properties in the traditional way. Okay, let's print this out and see first. Okay, so it's both prints the same way. ID uh, for the first case I put 100 and second case I put 200 and I see 100 at 200. Pretty good. Okay, so so second case is going to be more beneficial when I don't have a parameterized constructor, right? 
So in this case, I'm actually not making use of the parameter as constructor. So that's how if I don't have it and consider I have 10 different uh, properties that I need to initialize, I can initialize them straight away without, without caring about whether this uh, class is having a parameterized constructor or not. And also I can um, pass for some of them and ignore for the rest. I can do this way also. I just pass ID, <coughs> just ID. I can do this. So this adds more flexibility for you to choose the values directly and initialize it directly instead of doing this way when you don't have a default constructor, right? If you have a default constructor, then the best way to do is you already know how you're going to do it. You're going to call the default constructor. But in the, in the case of default constructor, that means it, if it is taking two parameters, then I have to pass those two parameters, right? I'll create another here. I'll say, yep, let's put it not default parameterized. In this case, I will say person p, say something p2 is equal to new person and pass the values. In this case, if you see, we have a two uh, constructors. The second one is taking ID. I'll say some 500 and say John, some name. And then I'll say p2 dot print. So this is a good way when you have a parameterized constructor. Again, once you do this, uh, we'll see the output. It's pretty good. It prints 500 and John. So how different is this object initializer is? Again, as I mentioned, this you can use irrespective of the class having a parameterized constructor or not. It doesn't care. And in case of parameterized constructor, if it is taking two um, parameters, then you need to pass two arguments, definitely. You cannot skip one. In this case, object initializer, if you don't have a value for some uh, one of the properties, you, you can actually ignore it. You don't care about it. So you can do this way when you have an object initializers. So that's the benefit of having the object initializers. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. It's not too lengthy. And yes, I'll leave this uh, code uh, snippet. And uh, hope uh, that is clear enough. It's not too complicated a topic to elaborate on that. The next one is a similar to this collection initializers and we did see this collection initializers in most of our sessions so we will <clears throat> wrap it quickly again and yes we just compare with the traditional way of uh, using the collections versus the collection initializers so the traditional way for a non-generic collection in this case array list is a non-generic collection and you hope you understand what is a non-generic and what is a generic collection we did talk about several times uh, I don't want to repeat and confuse you. So in the error list, uh, we can take any any data type here. It's can, it's can be string, number, anything. In this case, we are taking strings. We create an instance of the error list uh, using the new operator and the data type. And the, for the variable, we uh, call the add method and add the values to it. So that's how we traditionally make use of it. And similarly, for generics, we specify the data type when we declare and then we'll keep adding. So when you define the respective data type, so uh, the respective uh, uh, instance will take only the respective type, no other. In the non-generic version, the add method can take an object. That means it can take any value type or reference type, anything. So that's a core difference. And if you print the if you want to print the values out for either case, uh, this is a generic. Uh, uh, or a, a common method to print, uh, which is taking i enumerable as a parameter. That means i enumerable. So both the cases, uh, where, whereas in, in terms of uh, generic list or array list, all of them uh, implement the i enumerable. And since they implement i enumerable, you can define the method a generic way, and of course make use of for each and look up for object because it can be anything so it can be generic way to handle that is an object and then print it out okay so this is a very generic one which i can make use of either with a non generic collection or a generic collection now we'll see the what's new with the collection initializers 
uh, how can you do this uh, kind of lengthy statement into a very concise way here's here's what we can do so error list you can actually create a new error list and within the brackets you can specify the list of uh, numbers which we have seen in one of the other example also and uh, yeah, similarly for generic list we can do the same thing we can straight away initialize it uh, passing the values within the curly bracelets and that's how we can initialize them and you can still uh, use the same method print values to print these values directly so it's everything remains same only the way is initialize these uh, array collection is what different and this is again a very quick easy one now uh, and we have covered this several times so I hope you don't have any issues understanding that if you still have any problem ping me a line uh, in the questions part I can take care of your questions uh, at the end of the session, okay? And it's again a straightforward one, um, pretty simple collection. We just printed out using both the ways, traditional way and the collection initializers introduced in 3.0. Okay, so that's all about it. And uh, yes, the, length, the, the, the amount of code that you have can be just simplified to one line. That's the benefit of having the initializers like that. Anonymous types. This is again interesting. So we have seen anonymous methods. Don't confuse between anonymous methods and anonymous types. Both are two different things. Anonymous methods are introduced in 2.0 framework whereas the anonymous types got introduced in 3.0 and anonymous types are very very interesting. <coughs> again Okay, so these are the traditional way of having a class we have seen just now. Having a person with set of properties, constructors, or some instance methods, and making use of that this way. Person P, PID, name, print, right? So this is how we make use of a create a class and then make use of the person class uh, in general so far. So how we can concise that more. If you Look at this uh, top level big section can be one statement. So this is anonymous types. So types means if you see anonymous methods, methods without a name, but they have parameters and body, right? So just like any normal methods, a named method or un anonymous becomes an unnamed. And the next version to the anonymous methods is the lambda expressions, which we have seen good enough. And now comes the anonymous types. Now the types don't have name. That's interesting. So now the classes uh, that you can have a classes on the fly without having their definition created and straight away using directly. So how you can do that? It's you can do that using just a new operator and set of properties and values. Again, if you see the type inference that we have seen so far, again the type inference play a big role in determine or what is the data type that you want to associate it in this case uh, what, we, what what we're doing here is when I say ID is equal to 200 okay so you want a type that has ID as a property and it takes a value 200 because since 200 is a integer okay so you want to make the ID of type int okay so ID I, it's compiler is going to create a some anonymous type some in memory class with some name it doesn't have a name uh, to visualize so it's going to have an ID as a property that we normally create specifically uh, specify um, so it's going to infer your property as ID and its data type as integer done and again it's going to infer that you want a name as a property and because of the value is specified here is a string okay you want to make it as a string data type so name you have a property with the type string done that's how it's going to infer your initializers to build an anonymous type internally so that's again cool right so you, it's, it's again type safe how if the next statement if I try to add the same thing with the same ID with the string then it's not going to accept because 
the first statement it already you already defined the ID to be an integer and it is going to be integer throughout the life and <clears throat> of course the uniqueness is matched based on the type number of parameters that you're putting in and also their names that's how the uniqueness is determined if you pass ID is equal to some string name is equal to some number and third one as something else then that's going to be a, uh, it's a separate class so it's not going to object you so if at all you pass another one with the same ID with some different data type and name as a different data type then it's going to crib it's going to keep saying okay you said ID is supposed to be integer now you're saying it is string no you, you can't do that so it because your bypassing the type safety check so <clears throat> it is type safe again and where is again our favorable friend to help us because you don't know what type it is at uh, design time the var is going to come for rescue so var is going to be generic again once the p2 determines okay this is going to be a type that is having two properties one is an id and name so you are actually asking for an anonymous type okay let me create a type for you so your compiler is going to create a class the whole definition of the class whatever you have here inside the compiler and we'll see that we'll examine that difference by looking at the msil Hope you remember what is an MSIL. Um, so we did uh, walk through the MSIL several locations uh, and looking at uh, once you compile the code, how does it look like in the intermediate language? And we'll see that comparison, uh, comparing having a, a a class definition like this and creating a class like this. So in this both the examples, I have same ID, same name. But in this case, ID and name, of course, I specified it's going to be integer, string, and it's named as person. And here, there's no name. I didn't specify ID to be integer. I didn't specify name to be string, but it just created. Right? And when I say to string, that's an, another interesting aspect here. I had a print method here to print my ID and name. right? And if you take a look at this statement, I just called p2 dot two string the two string implementation is smart enough it is going to look up all the IDs and give me this output if you take at this output take a look at this output and map to my output here this is what I have written and this is what the built-in implementation is giving me which is same right almost same only difference is uh, the way it is formatted otherwise I'm getting my ID back I'm getting my name back all I care about is that right so it's pretty good, interesting and so concise way you can actually write and of course there are limitations of course there are limitations it doesn't mean that the anonymous types are going to replace the class definition itself uh, the class again holds good for many of the scenarios wherein your object oriented principles when you create an anonymous types they cannot participate in the object oriented programming because uh, in, uh, I mean to say, they're still class, they're still object oriented, but you cannot actually have the uh, ability to extend them because they don't have a name and you cannot extend them. They don't, don't exist. So, and we'll see more of that uh, when we examine the intermediate language. Okay, let me first uh, take a happy path and uh, demonstrate that code. And the code is here. Once we see the happy path, then we'll get into the more details of it okay this is my standard person class where I have ID name same old thing which we have been seeing every time with the uh, constructors we have one default one parameterized and the one prints method one instance method it's a simple person class and now in my main method I have created an instance of that and same thing which we have seen so far ID initialized with 100 name with some value print invoked and the print is going to print ID and name as simple as that and now using the object initializer which we have seen just uh, before this wherein we can create a uh, person we again in this case I am actually referring to my person class right and initializing my ID and name and creating p1 right and which is uh, again var because this is again of course the types of data type and I'm calling the print method which again of course goes back to my implementation right and now comes the completely anonymous 
and anonymous is completely anonymous it doesn't care about I can actually add say a new parameter like I will say okay I can add a property on the fly it doesn't care right and okay let me add one more instance Let's see how it's going to behave. Will it uh, stop me doing this or will it let it go? 21, okay. It's okay. It flies good. It flies absolutely fine. No issues with it completely. So anonymous is completely dynamic. You can add any, anything on the fly and go ahead. Okay. I compiled. It says does not exist. Yes, does not exist. It's 21. And now I print this out. Okay, so it's perfectly fine. It doesn't creep about having the same ID. This will, uh, the scenario what I mentioned when I'm having ID as a uh, number here and ID as a, a string here that becomes a problem when you actually associate this to a collection again to a generic collection wherein the type safety matters in this case since p2 and p21 are completely two different objects used independently it doesn't really care about because they you can still have a separate class with the same uh, id and data type so anonymous doesn't care about it once you have these into a collection of a generic collection then it's going to be a problem so it's going to check for the type safety when you say id is a number and it should be a number otherwise it's going to crib okay so that's the scenario which i was referring to okay now in this case we'll see um, how the msi looks like right we'll see the i think that's part of my next slide actually i have it here how does the msi look like we will see that again opening the MSIL, how to open the MSIL. So this is how the MSIL represent my concrete class versus the anonymous class. And uh, interestingly, if you map both, then we can see the differences, how the mapping is done. Okay, surprisingly, I have an, uh, in my concrete definition of person, I have ID and name properties, which are again instance properties, which are associated with the instance because they are not static. Again, they are of type in 32 and string. Okay, and in this case, if you see uh, ID, it's again defined as an instance, and the uh, data type again, it is it is not specified here. Okay, that's uh, but the data data type is specified. Uh, nowhere it's specified the data type, so it's actually private. In in general, the fields are private and they are internal which is 0 and 1 just uh, having a mapping to it so that's how it is uh, anonymous again so it can have anything on the fly again they are not uh, going to be unique across and they are, are defined uh, on the fly and if you see this this statement of the complete filled one means it's a concrete one and this is an anonymous one which is an empty icon and another important thing, this class, this person class has an access modifier of public because I made it as a public. Whereas by default, the anonymous classes are private and also sealed. And you know what is sealed means. That means they cannot be inherited any further. And hence, you cannot use anonymous classes uh, to be uh, completely object oriented because you cannot actually inherit and extend them. And you will lose the object oriented uh, uh, features completely whereas if you have your person as a concrete implementation then you can have all those uh, uh, features available uh, you can extend them uh, and you can actually make your own customize it whatever way you want and whereas anonymous you will not have any control over how it's going to be and of course uh, surprisingly if you see the get ID get name the properties are implemented get ID get name is available and also the constructors if you see the constructors uh, taking ID and name it is a parameterized constructor. In other words, it is a kind of a parameterized constructor where it's just similar to what I have, wherein I just specify the type where here it isn't. 
and uh, yes ID and the name these are the private data members that are implicitly built and it does have the fields created to hold those variable out so everything is a class except with the limitations so and code wise if you see it's so lengthy and it's just very concise and but again so when we will use the anonymous type and when will you use the concrete implementation as I said when you really want your um, classes to be uh, extendable and scalable in your application then you definitely have to go with the person uh, your uh, named types other, otherwise a concrete implementation whereas when you're dealing with uh, collections on the fly for example if you're dealing with uh, a, a database um, interaction or you want to create uh, a, um, a collection of objects uh, on the fly mapping to a given external database which you have no idea about and in that cases you can actually go with anonymous types you can create a collection so based on the data inputs that are coming from an external data source it could be a flat file or an XML or a an external database engine or SQL server or an Oracle so in that cases if you don't have the knowledge or the tightly coupling of the data from your application to the external data source in that case you can actually make use of the anonymous types and it's going to be pretty useful uh, on the fly you can create and then make use of uh, collections okay so we did uh, yeah we wanted to yeah I wanted to show the output how it looks like in MSI we have seen the slide so how we can do that we can actually go to the bin folder and this is my compiled exe what I do is just copy this uh, path and then go to my um, all programs since I have 2010. Uh, 2010 uh, the IL BASM is available as a menu item otherwise I can actually go through the command prompt which is the command prompt and then ILDASM which stands for uh, intermediate language uh, disassembler assembler we did see what is an assembler also if you remember carefully we did see what is an assembler that's one uh, tool used to build the assembly is compiled one completely after the uh, compilation is done and the disassembler is just an opposite to it which can be used to um, view the compiled intermediate language code so this is the anonymous type that we have seen in the slide and it has since I had the new member I can see that member here and also the built-in person uh, ID and name which is concrete one here within this and it is uh, anonymous is completely outside my thing it's false and the completely uh, treated as some completely separate one altogether okay hope that helps okay so the next one is the implicitly typed arrays um, so we're going to be crossing little more than two hours uh, today so I would just wanted to complete this one uh, the next one is the query I see it shouldn't take more than 30 minutes from now uh, considering all, I have two more uh, three more topics including this one um, so we want to wind up this uh, 3.0 and next session onwards uh, we will uh, see more interesting topics Okay, so the background of the implicit type arrays. So if you see the arrays, how we used to do in the traditional way, um, we create a data type like this with the open brackets, square brackets, create the variable name, and then initialize it with the given dimension, which is size. And of course, you can have a single dimensional, multi dimensional, also jagged arrays we have seen in the previous um, uh, sessions. And how you read them, you can read using the for and uh, also you can use the for each surprisingly and how for each because when I say int array array of int with this uh, statement with this uh, brackets uh, it's going to make uh, your uh, instance as map to system dot array class when it is system dot array actually implements I enumerable interface so that's how we can actually make use of for each on the arrays also 
and we did talk about that in detail. And in the print value in this case, how we are printing that values out using the for each here. Okay, so I, I have both the flavors here uh, using the for wherein we use the indexer to read the values out of the array and also for each wherein we use the item um, uh, of a type in this case object to be generic enough and this is taking array. If you see this is an array, this is a system.array it's taking and I'm able to pass the uh, t int array directly to this because once I make this int of array this variable becomes uh, it will actually inherit from system.array class and that's how it can fit into this example directly and using the for each I can iterate through the statements uh, through the items and read the values out. So this is the traditional way of how we used to do. Now implicitly typed arrays this is again, uh, actually we did uh, see this uh, when we did talk about the arrays. Uh, I just want to recap again. Uh, this is because it's a part of the 3.0 features. Uh, here in this case, uh, we're not specifying the data type. If you see this, here there is no int specified. We are using the popular var from 3.0 onwards. And var means, okay, I don't know what data type you want. I, I will determine based on the values that you assign to it. That's what var means. Okay, so that's uh, again I have a variable name created and initialized with the new operator with the same popular uh, brackets, square brackets and the values assigned to it. Okay, and I know where I'm specifying it's going to be int or something. So it's going to infer based on the values that I'm passing in for the initializer. So that's an implicitly typed arrays. Okay always difficult to draw a straight line for me with this tool. Okay, now it's straight line. And the second case, I'm passing a double. Since one is again an integer, but one of the value is a double, that means it's, it takes some a floating point there and hence the resultant array determines to be a double of array. And finally the string. And I just pass all the strings and yes, it determines to be string. And if I pass one of the values as an integer in this case, it's going to crimp. It's going to say no. Uh, you said it's going to be string and it's going to be string. You cannot actually pass another data type to it because that's uh, that's how the um, the data types also the, the arrays are again type safe. When you specify a given type, they will be to that type. Unlike the arrays or array list, uh, unlike the array list. This is a kind of a generic. Again, they are type safe collections at the same time, but the generics are completely different than the um, than the arrays. Uh, in sense, the in the way how you define the data types, which we discussed again. I don't want to recap on that again in detail and take your time. And yes, how do we know if this is defined as an int, right? So if I print out in this case, if you see the get type, get type and full name what it's going to print out for me is the respective data type. If you see this, um, in this case, int array is actually of type int 32, right? And again, it's uh, system dot double array. We can see the type here clearly that that uh, is uh, inferred to the respective data type here. And uh, in the first case, uh, this is our traditional way, it actually Directly we space whether it's going to be int and that's how it's system dot int thirty two. Okay. And yes, the same arrows are available there. Now we'll see the quick demo of that as well. Anonymous is good to go. And uh, we want to see the implicitly type arrays, right? And again, all these topics are actually updated uh, in the uh, in the spreadsheet as a course uh, curriculum. Uh, you can actually walk through those topics, and also I provided a, a link from MSDN, uh, which you can actually refer for further reading. And you can actually map the respective topic and uh, look up in the MSDN. That's the best material you can actually make use of it. And I'm not providing these slides because these slides are not going to be very helpful to you because. 
our slides do have only the code that you are gaining access to uh, and of course most of the texts are verbal uh, hence the slides are not going to be useful for you if you even take a look at them. So the best way you can actually refer to these topics is map the topics that I have in the course curriculum in the P, uh, PDF that you have on the SkyDrive and uh, for the respective session you can actually map to the MSN link and uh, that's a, MSN link is a pretty good enough uh, based on your understanding what I'm talking you can actually learn more on these topics. Okay so this is the same thing print values uh, where it's taking an array and printing the using the for each and similarly I have for statement as well I'm just using two ways to read the values out and if you know the remember if you recollect what's the difference between the for each and for using for each you cannot update them uh, values within the um, it's in the collection whereas uh, if you want to update them you have to iterate through the for uh, that's one difference between the for and for each based on usage wise and uh, yes again yeah, I think I have this repeated one I can take care of that okay so and implicit real time to one in this case it is an int array in this case uh, compared to the slide I even have the base type added up here which will tell you that it is uh, the base type is actually what take a look base type is actually system word array okay so when we say that uh, when whenever you declare an uh, array using these parameters you know where we are saying that you inherit from system dot array but implicitly it's actually inheriting from the uh, that's the compiler responsibility to map it to the uh, system dot array and that's when you gain the additional uh, methods like the length and so uh, the task couple of more uh, methods sorry this code is running okay we can take a look at that but still yeah, at this level you can see the get type is again is part of the system dot object and uh, type has again base type so these are not specific to system dot array if you want to take a look at the various methods available for um, system dot array, its best thing is put a dot. The period operator is going to list out all the uh, members available for your data type, and these are part of the system dot array class. Right, so long value and other things. Okay, so the topic for today is the implicitly typed arrays. So arrays can be declared using the var keyword with what's specific in the data type based on the value that you assign to it. Again in this case we, if you try adding an integer like this what will happen? No best type font for implicitly typed array. So you can't able to resolve um, your integer versus string. So it needs to be all strings. So that's how it is type safe again and of course yeah that's what the example here is trying to show you oops this error is what we commented out and if you declare things like that like this with the combination of a different data types it's not going to be flying okay it's going to crib it's going to say no it's not possible although you are going towards the concise way of writing the code they are still type safe, they are still secure, they still holds all the benefits of um, the .NET language. Okay, um, the query expressions. This is the tip of the iceberg now. So we have uh, passed so many things and now the query expressions will be a completely a new dimension now. Uh, don't be afraid and uh, don't be afraid completely. This is uh, one of the very strong feature. That's the reason why you have anonymous methods introduced. That's the reason why you have lambda expressions introduced. All that introduced because because of the strong feature called query expressions. We did not start with query expressions and uh, went into the detail. Uh, we actually covered from the bottom up so that we understand the basics behind the query expression. So this is the tip of the iceberg and we have actually came from the bottom up and uh, the query expressions if you look at the term carefully it is not specific to C sharp or .NET it is a generic term uh, 
uh, which involve uh, the database queries expressions, standard SQL in other words. Uh, if you are aware of what is a SQL, then it's, you understand it much better. You have a, a SQL statements for query. It's a query language, and the language is actually built with an expressions, which is a select, order, where clause, a group by, join. All these are various expressions. Those are all refers to a query expressions. And now, why this is related to .NET now? That's the um, biggest. Um, advantage in introducing the query expressions in the language. So .NET actually introduced the link as a concept which is actually uh, referred to as a language integrated query which is we are going to look at that. Uh, before we go to the link uh, we see the query expression. In other words query expression is a, a language kind of a, a clauses that we normally see in a writing a query which is refers to the clauses like select clause, you have a where clause, you have a order by clause and all those things, right? So far we have seen lambda expressions and anonymous methods and how they are related to this, we'll see quickly now. And uh, now we get introduced to the most popular namespace, the system.link. You will definitely love this, definitely love this. This is a really a very good feature of .NET and uh, if we see the statement completely, you will definitely don't understand how it has been done and what is happening behind the scene when you write a uh, query like this. Take this example of, uh, take a close look at this example. So here I have a generic list, list of person, which is a generic list but it is type safe. That means my person list can take only persons as a parameter. Because again, that's the reason I need to actually include this namespace. Okay, just clear system dot. Oops, oops. Okay, what I'm trying to do is highlight this system dot collection dot generic. Now, what is link doing here? That's interesting. So when we see have this is raw data, raw data in my dot net program. Okay, so by using query expressions in .NET language, we are actually trying to write the SQL queries in the language. It doesn't mean that we are going to replace the database engine completely, but most of the uh, database operations you can actually perform in the language without having a database engine. How good is that? You can have a collections like this. So this is the end part of the collection. So the, we have collections. You can able to manage it. You can have any time add up to the collection. And now, how to query the collection is a thing. How to query them? How to join two different collections? Uh, just like a two different tables. So each of the collections we have seen so far, we can actually treat them as an individual database tables. How good is that? So you can have a relationship established between two different tables, jo apply the joins, query, query, filter them. We have seen how to filter them. We have seen how to uh, sort them. We have seen some part of it using the, our lambda expressions. And the next part is the link. So using link, it's a query expressions that you can write uh, and just like the same dot um, SQL queries on your in on your in memory collections not database again okay so this is going to be very very useful when you want to play around with uh, heterogeneous databases inside the programming language and you don't need an external server to handle your query uh, or uh, query need so once you have the data built into your collections you can actually do wonders you can actually do your dotnet language use a dotnet language to filter it this is going to be especially going to be very very powerful when you're playing with flat file data, especially with CSV files or XML files, you can load the XML files into the uh, application and you can actually join with different multiple other XML files and also uh, write queries to filter out the way you normally do in a database. Everything is possible. And we'll see some of that today. Okay, not everything and the remaining thing is up to you. You can actually Google out. There are so many good examples on link and uh, definitely you don't want to miss that. It's a very, very good feature. I strongly recommend you to take a look at the other more other examples. And in my session today, I'm going to see uh, show you how it's going to be mapped 
to the lambda expressions or the anonymous methods we have seen so far. In fact, the lambda expressions is a ba uh, is a behind uh, scene what's happening, and you know, all the delegates and the lambda expressions are the one which are actually driving the whole link concept. Although you don't see a keywords like a delegate, although you don't want see you don't see a keywords like a lambda operator, you won't, you won't even see the lambda operator in this case. So it's but in, internally it is converted to the lambda expressions and that's how the compiler is going to translate these uh, queries and make them work for you. Okay, so take a look at uh, the simplest example here. Here I have the uh, generic list, person list, and I have some of the person collection, which is my own class, right? This person is my own class. I defined it and I added that here, right? And again, this will be a good try if you try to do it with the anonymous methods and anonymous types try this example with anonymous types and see what compiler is going to say okay that can be your assignment and now um, the var now we have this var long back right now this the real use of var you can see here since this query can return some x, y, z, I don't know what that's going to be, some collection of something, I don't know. Um, but of course, it's going to be returning a collection of something. So that's why it's var. So based on the output of your expression, um, the data type is determined. Usually, it could be uh, a type that implements i enumerable, ideally, because it's a collection, right? And your query expression starts with from unlike uh, SQL statements which uh, actually starts with a select statement or a delete statement or a DML statement in other words or a DDL statements. Uh, uh, query expressions start with from. It's actually in the reverse order. Actually the bottom most will come the um, select is coming at the last. It's you if you know the SQL um, language it, it usually starts like this. Select uh, name it's a field name in other words in this case c dot name from table name in this case my table is person okay where c dot name and say is equal to okay john so this is how a normal select query looks like in SQL. Um, it could be uh, in T-SQL or TPL-SQL, doesn't matter. Uh, it's as per the SQL. I hope I'm good with the syntax wise. I'm not going to validate that, but that's how it's going to look like. Okay, so if you look at the query expression in .NET, it's going to be just upside down, right? So from, it's what it starts with. From C in personal list. Personal list is here. This is my database. In other words, my table or my collection. So this is my collection list. And C is something because type inference. C is something in my list. I don't know what is C, right? Um, it, it, the, the type of C is determined based on my clause that I'm going to put or the content of my person list. In this case, uh, the type inference is smart enough. C is going to be determined as a type that person list is going to contain. In this case, person list is going to contain a person because it's a generic list, right? It's straightforward. C becomes person now. Clear? So C is inferred to be a person. And now I can actually access all the properties or methods that a person has. That means they are part of my C. This is just like for each statement. Okay, from C in person list and now the where clause. A where clause where C dot name is uh, compared to John, some value. Now pick what? Select C. That means select C. When I say C, that means person, right? Now C is a person now. So that's how the query you need to interpret. And now if you want to add uh, additional Oops, okay. Additional clauses you can add uh, on top of this, like a where clause, join statements, or anything else, like just like a query. So the first example is just showing you to filter out, it's in other words, get me the 
this statement is saying get me the person among this list whose name is John that means who's here right? I'm going to filter the person with John how good is that so uh, once I get that uh, query done I'm just printing the values right so this query is going to run when you actually invoking so the if you look at the statement here this is just like your delegate call right this is just as good as a delegate invoking the delegate and the delegate has and some expression attached to it and what is this expression translated to it's translated to this lambda expression if you see this uh, var query person list and person list uh, is a generic list and it has a where method which is taking a predicate which is going to take a parameter of c c is because a person and c has a name dot equals if you say dot equals is a method available in the uh, name that means name is actually string string has a equals method right equals john and then dot select so the output of that dot select c and you see the lambda expression again that means you have on the left hand side is a parameter that you're getting on the right hand side you're actually returning that as is out so at the same time you can actually do return something else here you can actually say c dot name only in other words if i had a query dot like uh, select name alone right in this case I'm, i can say c dot name so it's going to return you only the name column out how good is that so now that's the relation between your link query on the top and once it's converted to a lambda expression internally by the compiler it becomes a query like this and you won't see this when you do this so that's now again wrapped around it so that now going forward when you play with the links you will be used to this expressions that's why it's called an expression so expression and a statement are, are again correlated to each other and we'll see in the next uh, topic all the expression uh, trees which is uh, uh, a kind of a base uh, again behind the conversion of the given expression into a another form in this case this is an, just an expression that is translated to the uh, C-sharp language so that uh, the language can interpret uh, your query uh, expression into uh, code that can be executed uh, using the CLR and printed and you don't see this anymore in other words take a look at this you can write this statement and also this statement both do the same okay so in, you can look at it in that way and this is more user friendly if you see you don't see a lambda expression here this is more user friendly because this is a near match to a SQL query and whereas this is not that user friendly you need to actually really break this and then understand right then only you can um, interpret what the statement is really mean and we did spend a lot of time in interpreting the lambda expressions so far so hope that uh, helps out right and the next example here and this is another example wherein we're actually listing everything select just C and we're actually ordering based on the C dot name and we can imagine how the order is done we have seen the other built-in interfaces uh, which can be used to do this right and the link uh, is coming with uh, multiple flavors like now whatever we are seeing here is a link to objects and the same thing is available for link to SQL which you can actually directly connect to the database and uh, play around with the database in which case this uh, expression is going to be translated into the database language whereas the, we have seen the select statement so it need to translate this expression into the SQL query and run it in the SQL database that you're connecting to and give you the result back as a query and then uh, it's the mapping between the data, how the database uh, stores the data versus how you can play around with the .NET uh, objects uh, with the collections especially and similarly you have a link to XML which you can uh, which, uh, which has the ability to translate the XML information into the collection so once you attach uh, your data source uh, we'll see uh, how we're going to 
play with both the uh, database and as well as with the XML also. But I think the next immediate thing will be XML for us soon after we finish. And you reading the print values is the same way using the for each loop that we have seen so far. No change in that. And this statement, if you see, it uh, result out only one item which is matching John. And of course, the same equivalent uh, code with the lambda expression will also give you the same result out. This is with the lambda expression. This is where with the query expression, which is the link query expression. And of course, the third one is actually sorting based on name, order by C dot name. So it's going to sort the list of names uh, the way you want, right? So we'll take a quick look of uh, look at this demo. Once this is done, uh, we are good. Actually, I'm not going to cover much of the expression trees, uh, which are which I'm going to leave them as a advanced topic. Query expressions. Hope I haven't uh, uncommented uncomment this out implicitly. That we I need to take this out. Otherwise, we're going to clip. <laughs> Hope you like this. This is the coolest feature um, available in 3.0, query expressions. Actually, 3.0 introduced this as a query expression and in, in the forthcoming releases uh, 3.5 and 4.0, Link has seen uh, very, very great advancements. So since we are actually uh, uh, playing around with the Visual Studio 2010, we are actually using the .NET Framework 4.0. How do you know which I, we are, I'm using 4.0? That should be a good question, actually, if you don't really, really want to know. For that to know, uh, you need to actually go to the uh, properties. Let me locate. Here you go. This is the target framework. If you go to the properties of your project, it will tell you which um, .NET Framework we are using. In this case, if I pick the 2.0, then all of my link will go away because I'm not referring to the right framework, right? And uh, again, if you might ask a good question, uh, like what is this client profile and what is this 4.0? What is the difference between the 4.0 and what is the difference between client profile? And the answer for that, I, I, I don't see many of you asking questions these days, but for some reason, but it's my curiosity to uh, cover as much as I can and as much as I know. Um, the client profile is uh, again a lightweight version of the framework uh, which can be uh, by default actually by default in uh, Visual Studio 2010 it maps to 4.0 client profile. Uh, this is especially going to be very lightweight uh, .NET framework which excludes some of the uh, major features, uh, not major features, some of the very features which are tightly coupled with the uh, with the uh, har hardware interface or the uh, with the hardware component directly like the CPU usage or the threading and other things. So, so a couple of things are excluded uh, from the client profile to minimize the size of the uh, framework. Uh, the size uh, becomes ideally uh, important when you actually host this application um, for a download uh, or uh, distribute this application as a redistributable package to other clients. So for clients to download your application and install in their local, uh, if you keep it to the client profile, the, the, long, the download size is going to be much concise and much small and the download size is going to be much faster. For that reason, uh, the client profile is added up as a uh, uh, new addition to the uh, from 3.5 onwards. It's not there uh, prior 3.5. It is there from 3.5. And of course, when you want to point to the respective framework, you can point this way. Okay, so that's one thing that I wanted to show you. And uh, yes, print. And this is the raw data that we have with the generic list of persons. And uh, this is the uh, statement of for this to work, you must use link system.link. So what will happen if I take it away? It breaks. It breaks uh, because the we are trying to use the where and sort. Oops. Okay. My drag is seriously problem. I'm not using mouse. That's why. Okay. So it's going to break several places because the um, the link uh, adds all these uh, various things, including your where clause, the select, and everything is coming as part of the link. And if you see, if I remove this, it's working. 
if you take a close look at this, this is nothing but the extension methods. If you remember how we did the extension methods, uh, we add an extension method to an existing type and how you refer that? You refer that using just a namespace and in this case, I still have my uh, static, oh, sorry, uh, the generic list. So, so soon after I remove my system.link, my where is gone or even the select will be gone because this compiler is scripting that you can't able to have that because those are available as an extension methods in system.link. So that's a very easy way to integrate with the existing collections, right? So as long as you just import that namespace, you're good. So that's the keynote there. Uh, these uh, link features are added to the existing collections, uh, like the generic lists example, um, uh, as an extension methods. So that's a very good point to remember. And of course, this is the query expression. This is a link query. My goodness, link query and the equivalent to that is here, which is a lambda expression and we see the lambda operator there and the third one is the query, right? And it's going to query by uh, all with the uh, order by filter. You can actually explore this in many ways. Um, you can add a couple of more attributes to it and you play around. Uh, there's a lot to play around with the link just like a database, right? You can actually have a more complicated queries, um, uh, complicated queries you can write in link. And these are the various translations in the query expressions. And uh, to just qu quickly wrap uh, uh, with this slide, the where clause, uh, in this case, if it is from C in customers where C dot city is equal to uh, London, then you know the some value, select C, that can be translated to a, a equivalent uh, lambda expression using the where C lambda expression c dot city is equal to London. So similarly, again, the popular questions people do ask in interviews, right? Or they can ask you as simple as, give me the link query to read out uh, employee name and employee salary. It could be as simple as that. So all that you need to do is, it's a simple query from C, that table, whatever, you know, you see the where clause and select C, C dot name or C dot uh, salary. As simple as that. You just have to memorize this. Uh, as long as you work more with this, you will get used to it. It's as good as you know learning a new language. Now it's this expression you need to just make make sure it it sits in your uh, memory just like your language. So that expression is going to stay there for a long time. You know, link again in uh, 4.0. There are more rich features added up in Link for uh, handling uh, large files, which was one of the drawback in uh, 3.5. Um, in the older versions, whenever the uh, link was used, there were a lot of limitations in how the link is going to be used. Uh, it's not that it's not going to replace database completely, that's for sure, because database still handles large volume of data indexing and other objects or triggers and other things are still going to be there. Uh, the link is going to reduce some of the network traffic. Uh, once we have the data imported into the application, you can actually cache it uh, into your uh, caching and then um, uh, present the data in the required format based on the user inputs, which is going to reduce your network traffic. So for every filter, you don't have to hit the database server, in other words. Uh, so it's going to be very, very useful. And the select clause <coughs> can be translated into the respective uh, um, uh, lambda expression. So the idea here is that these uh, conversions are important uh, to understand so how these are correlated to the lambda expressions and how this is important because if you want to customize it to the way you want it, you there are so many. These are, these are the simplest version that you are looking at uh, with respect to the uh, query expression, and there are more and more complex way when you try to join multiple uh, tables to it, and there are, it was going to a little more complex and that's why if you want to reduce uh, joining multiple tables is again not feasible with link. Uh, it, it is doable but it is uh, uh, not recommended to do it because it's not going to be that uh, efficient um, just like in database. Uh, database is again still more efficient. Uh, you can, there are places where you can make use of link and there are definitely places where you cannot uh, make use of link. 
Okay, so the last topic for the day is expression trees. Now what is an expression tree again? We have uh, seen an expression so far as a lambda expression and the expression trees and actually relates to a data structure uh, of expressions. So if you, uh, if you see the expressions itself is stored as a data inside uh, an expression so that this can be uh, translated to the respect of how it is useful again. So we don't want to get into more details of it. Uh, again, this is going to be too lengthy topic again. So I want to minimize this. I just want to introduce to the keyword called expression trees. Uh, these trees are translated, translates the code uh, to a data. In other words, uh, once we have an expression called x plus y, that expression x plus y can be transformed into a data and vice versa. Okay, so uh, we have seen that in different ways like the func uh, in this case, in this pretty example, uh, func int int uh, which is a two, one input parameter, another one is an output uh, type. Uh, it takes an integer as an input and returns an integer. That's what we have seen here. What is the func and f? Is it, uh, and it evaluates, takes a number in and increments that to number plus one here. That's a code. Once you encapsulate this expression or this function, um, into an expression which is a system.query.expression that's the namespace to be precise um, system.query.expression can hold this as a data why is it important again so, so this is how it is done so in a link to SQL especially we have seen again with the link to objects wherein the uh, the expressions are transformed into the respect to code like the 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 expression of the link is transformed into the lambda expression so that the C sharp compiler can compile it because in the link to objects who is doing the sorting and algorithm so who is doing the compiler is doing right C sharp code uh, the runtime CLR is doing no one else when you talk about um, um, uh, link to SQL link to SQL that means link to SQL database when you talk about link to SQL who is going to execute that uh, statement the, the respect to database engine definitely. So the, if, the, if you want to execute your um, link expression by the database engine, so you, what you need to do is your query in this case um, where you're actually db.customers, c.ct and other things, right? You're trying to do this. This needs to be transformed into respect to database query. To transform, in other words, if you see this, uh, this expression has some logic, right? So this expression states a couple of things. This is my source of data. This is the kind of operation that I want to perform, and this is the value. So you have a data along with the uh, along with the uh, kind of operation that you need to perform on the data. So all that information you're passing just as an expression, and that expression need to be translated into the respective engine to work with that and give you the right results back. So that transformation is done using the expression trees. So the expression trees will form the uh, transform the code into data and the data into code. So that's how the uh, the handshake between your compiler versus the respective database engine works tightly close by close each um, to each other and uh, make your things work uh, as expected. And that's the little overview of expression trees and there's uh, that's again a big topic to talk and you know, that's out of scope to my uh, session so you, if you're interested in exploring it you're more than welcome and the materials are pretty much out there um, MSG is the best thing as I've always been referring to and also again Google out there are so many articles available very interesting articles available online uh, which can help you uh, go ahead with that Okay, in this session we did walk through some of the advanced features uh, introduced in 3.5 uh, which are generic delegates, uh, function, um, function is a func uh, which takes uh, uh, an argument and also re uh, returns a t result. We did see what are the uh, uh, five different uh, out of box uh, funks uh, that were introduced in um, 3.5 which you can re which we can use it without uh, having declare them again and again and uh, uh, so going forward uh, the same thing were actually extended in uh, in C sharp 4.0 having 16 different flavors uh, uh, 16 different parameter versions uh, uh, were introduced in 4.0 
and uh, this is where the starting point for the uh, delegate, uh, so generic delegates. And also we did see the similar action as a generic delegate, uh, which doesn't return anything, which returns void, um, but will take some kind of uh, uh, different uh, variable uh, arguments or parameters uh, that we can pass in. And uh, similarly, the same uh, uh, action, generic delegates uh, have 16 different versions, uh, flavors that we have seen uh, in the Object Explorer. And also we did see the alumni expressions in uh, special line declarations such as the comparison, converter, predicate and uh, event handler. So event handler is something that I left it for your homework. Uh, you can easily explore it and then uh, uh, make use of it. So this one just list the uh, line item there. And we did see the object uh, initializers uh, introduced in 3.0 again. And we did see the collection initializers, uh, anonymous types was another very, very powerful feature. Uh, we did walk through the intermediate language uh, when, an, uh, when an anonymous type is declared, how it is treated, especially inside the uh, intermediate language. And we did see the implicitly typed arrays, uh, another very powerful topic. Another top very, very, very powerful topic is the query expressions we did see. Uh, how this can be, this is transformed into the link. Uh, this is pretty much the link queries where in C Sharp language wise it's called as a query expression. And uh, internally we did see how these query expressions are translated into lambda expressions uh, under, under the hood. And uh, the last one we saw is the expression trees and I just gave an overview how the expression trees help uh, in uh, transforming the code to data at uh, the real time uh, with a very good uh, just an overview. Okay, and with that we'll wind up uh, this uh, C Sharp 3.0 features and we'll jump into the other topics in the subsequent sessions.